This week's episode of the Secret Library Podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. To get a 30-day trial complete with a free audiobook download, visit secretlibrarypodcast.com slash audible. I did wonder, am I allowed to write about all of these minuscule details of a woman's life, like her interior world? Like, is, is anybody going to care? This is the Secret Library Podcast, the truth about writing books. Oh my God, everybody, it's episode 100. So exciting. Um, today we have Sarah Selecki talking about her new novel, Radiant Shimmering Light, as well as Mary Laura Philpot from Parnassus Books with her latest roundup of amazing reading suggestions. But before we get to those interviews, I wanted to share a few pieces of very exciting news. First of all, we have a new website. Some of you may have noticed last week that there was a surprise when you visited the site at secretlibrarypodcast.com. We had a little bit of a soft launch, and now we're making a formal announcement. So for those of you who haven't visited lately, take a peek at secretlibrarypodcast.com and see what you think. We have been working on it for ages, so I am so relieved that it is finally up because um, it was just killing me to look at the old design because I was so excited about the new one. So that is piece of news number one. Piece of news number two is that we have decided, Barry and I, after a lot of thought and discussion that we were going to launch a Patreon for the podcast. Um, The show has been a real labor of love for the past couple of years And we've had occasional sponsorship from services that we use and love. And as we started to look forward, now that we've hit episode 100, the show has its own website. um, We were thinking about our goals for the show going forward. And the things that really mattered to me were involving the listener community more directly. And I also wanted to spend more time making the show even better and providing some additional offerings. But um, between scheduling, recording, Barry's time editing, our work with our virtual assistants and posting and promoting the show, it takes up a ton of time. So the way we figured we could continue to do this and think about dedicating even more time was to start a Patreon. And this will help allow us to spend the time that we want to um, developing new ideas which will involve things like in-person meetups. We have a few cities where we've had a ton of authors on the show, as well as where we know a bunch of our listeners live. Um, We really want to do some in-person meetups. And I've also been dreaming about doing some events. So that's sort of a preview of what we're hoping to do going forward. But in the meantime, we really want to make the show um, sustainable. So if you'd like to check out the Patreon and consider supporting the show, We would really appreciate it. Um, You can visit the Patreon at patreon.com slash secret library. Okay, enough news. Let's get on with the interviews. When we started looking at the calendar as to when episode 100 was going to fall, I was fantasizing about who we would have on the show for episode 100. And I started making lists and thinking about it. And then I was in touch with Sarah Selecki and found out when her novel Radiant Shimmering Light was coming out. And I said, oh, it's perfect. So of course, Sarah's going to be episode 100. So Sarah needs no introduction because this is her third appearance on the show. And everyone who has listened, if you haven't yet, you'll have fun going back and listening to the two previous episodes with her in which she talks about the process of writing the book Radiant Shimmering Light. And so it was such a treat to get to episode 100 with Sarah and hear about the book now that it's out in the world. Um, For those of you who don't know Sarah, she is the creator of the Sarah Selecki Writing School and the story course, The Story Intensive, and is also the author of the collection of short stories, This Cake is for the Party. I am delighted to have not only called her an instructor, I am a student, former student of the Story Intensive, but also now um, I work with her as a TA in the Story Intensive and also to call her a friend. So it has been a joy getting to know Sarah and her writing. I know all of you listening have loved her episodes. I get notes about them all the time. So I'm very, very happy to celebrate episode 100 by having Sarah on to talk about the launch of her new book. So here we go with Sarah Selecki. Hey, Sarah. Thanks so much for being on. You are the first triple guest. I'm so honored. 
thank you so much for having me back. <laughs> well, I feel like this is sort of like the, you know, we were back when we were talking about where the idea came from initially when you were first on. And then we came back and talked about the editing process. And now we're here where everybody gets to get their mitts on the actual book very soon. I know. I know. So it feels like we weren't going to leave everybody hanging. We had to, we had to talk about this process. <laughs> I'm ready. So we, we were talking a little bit, I'll confess to the, to the listeners, we were talking a tiny bit before we started recording that there is this feeling of like being in the bardo that comes <laughs> between when you finish writing and when it's going to go into a physical form. Yeah. So I'm wondering yeah. if you can talk a little bit about that stage that you're sure. in. This is what I'm, this is like where I've been living for the past several months now. So I would love to, I'd love to talk about this. The book, as we are speaking right now, hasn't been released yet. It, it launches still in a couple months from now. And I have finished, you know, the final draft and then the final, final draft and then the final, final, final draft. And then there's like formatting fixes. And then even just yesterday, um, the copy editor sent me a question about one of the character's nicknames and do we want it? do we want to use this one or this one? Just they're, they're actually making sure they're proofreading and they're making sure that the nickname is not a misprint. But I went in there and was like, you know, this has been bugging me since I made that change. Let's switch it back to this. <laughs> I'm still making changes, tiny, tiny minuscule little changes that feel very important to me. Um, but probably aren't like in overall aren't as, aren't as important to any other reader, but that like, I'm still, it's still not outside of me. It's still not outside of my um, my sculpting and my writing and my changing. But it's pretty much absolutely done. And there are readers like yourself who have already read it. So it's in. So it's not. It's not mine, and it's not not mine. It's like it's really. Um, it's hard to rest Psycholo psychologically. Um, it's hard to rest. The same. The same sorts of dreams. So it, during revision my dreams started to get, um, actually you probably have experienced this too. Like during all states of the writing practice, when you get into that flow where you're really interacting with image and theme from a place where, from the subconscious place, of course your subconscious is, a, is all woke up and ready to provide you with all sorts of images. And, um, so your dreams stay, so your dreams get more vivid. Does that happen to you too? Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So my dreams are quiet now. So that's not ha like the, they're not giving me. The, I'm not. I'm not exactly in creation mode, but at the same time, I just can't. I just can't relax. Like I'm so antsy. <laughs> mm. I'm just antsy because I can't. I can't. It's hard to. Um, it's hard to put it to rest. Now I know what the antidote is and I am gearing up like I've given myself April 1st, like the, the next, the next date, the next month, the start of the next month is when I'm going to start. But the antidote of course is writing something new. Right. Like I know that's like, just get back into creation, get write something new, start writing like this, like hovering around this kind of halfway released, not released. This is not, it's not a good use. It's not a good use of my energy. <laughs> Um, so I know what I need to do and I'm just like gearing myself up to do it. Yeah, I think it's, that's a huge question, I think, because when you, you've done this Herculean effort, which as everyone listening knows, it's been, you know, we've been talking about this over the past <laughs> year and a half about this yep. book. And then you get to the end of something where you've done it. And I, I think this, maybe this is, I don't know, I know writing better than other art forms, but it feels a little bit unique to writing that you you don't really get to rest that much and say, "Woo, mm -hmm. that was great." I mean, I feel like when you make a film, there's a force. Right. You got to really gear up to make a film. You got to get everybody involved. You got to get funding. You got to do all this stuff. Yeah. But to write a book, there's just you and paper it's, or a computer. Oh my god, it's, it's so true. I think that's something to do with it. I mean, with I I, I have been looking at like musicians longingly and in fil film like tv <laughs> crews longingly like they have each other they're doing something that you could there's like a start and a finish there's like the collaboration together and then there's the break and you say goodbye and it's bittersweet and you're so right like the people in my life who aren't who haven't been in some way shape or form writing this along with me like writing their own novel or um i count you in this in this group caroline because Aww. you've been so a part of my the process like i've i've really stepped in and like 
um, we've opened up about that together in these calls. And but aside from those those people and my partner, like my husband, who's been watching this happen, nobody else knows. Like nobody else is a part of it. It's just like this weird, mysterious thing you do. You go away and you're like, are you on vacation? No. Are you working? No. It's not work. It's not play. It's like this space, this liminal space creation, um, you know, writing a novel that nobody else participates in. It really is like opening a portal and going into Narnia and then coming back out and no one, no one is aware. So how do you mark, how do you mark that? Um, I think with I'm marking it, and what I did last with my first book is with the book launch. Right. I mark it. I mark it with the celebration of the launch, and it's not you know it's not about selling books. It's not. It's it. I mean, it certainly is about sharing the book with other people, but just on a personal level, it's just about the release. The release. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, talk to everybody about it. it's like it's here. It's a. It's like you know. It's um. There's gonna be a party, but until then it's really hard to be like, I'm finished. Like, are, am I? <laughs> right. <laughs> Prove it. Because <laughs> you could always, I mean, as we discussed the draft that, you know, I read looks, it's it's like an editor's looking draft. It's like a bound printed eight and a half by 11 kind of A4 size for British listeners. Right. Um, draft rather than the little bound manuscript, which does give you the the feeling that it's still in play. Right. Still in process. Yeah still a work in process. And, and it is, I think there are things, I mean, I'd love to see that copy. I think there are things in your copy, small changes that I've made, probably not super significant to like, you know, the story you've read it, you know, the story now, but there are still, there were changes made since that draft that you've read. So, um, it is still in progress. It is still in progress. I have a collector's edition. You do. I don't know what draft number that is, but you do. Yeah. But you know what else? My, I believe that when I when I bring this book into the world and start interacting with it in a new way with other readers, um, which I'm really excited about, uh, nervous slash excited, but mostly excited, I will still be, I'm sure, making little edits before the readings that I go to. So my my first, this cake is for the party, my reading copy of that book is all marked up with things that I've changed, things that I've changed for readings, things that I've, I've like had second thoughts about and like read it. Like it's always in process for me um, when I take my reading copy out into the world. And I'm sure that will still happen. I'm sure I'll get, I'll make, I'm going to make a reading copy of Radiant and I will still be working on it. It's just, <laughs> um, it's not, st- it's not static. It's not static. I think this is the curse of the writing mind is that it's, <laughs> it, it's never the, the same mind that can make up a story. It's very hard to let it go. I mean, you're not the first person I've heard actually say that on the show. Ben Percy was on. He's just like, oh, yeah, I'm always editing as I'm mm-hmm. reading. I'm like reading it out loud and like, no, I don't like that word. I'm going to change it mm-hmm. <laughs> at readings. Well, we're different. We're different people. And like the as you write, as you are writing, especially a novel in that form where you like lock in with a character in a story for the long form and really attach to the transformation like and go through it on a very real level with your character you see how the character is always evolving. And then there's this false stop to that evolution in the novel. It's fa- I just say it's false because it's like humans keep growing. Like you can't stop, like life keeps growing. You don't, you, I keep having to repot my plants because they still, the roots go out, the leaves grow out. Like <clears throat> there's no potted plant size that then is like going to work in my house forever because it's that size. Growth keeps growing. <laughs> and in the novel, I've put like, I, I've chosen to stop it at the point that I did to show that this journey stops here in the, in this, like I framed it at this beginning and this end. So the four months of this is four months, January, February, March, April, May, yeah, five months, the four or five months of that novel, it stops there. And I chose to stop it there, but that doesn't mean that my character stops there. And similarly, when you're reading your work aloud, often by the time publishing Publishing print, publishing works moves so slowly still. That industry moves so slowly. I mean, from the time I finish this book to the time it's coming out is actually super fast. Um, just all things considered, this is this feels rushed in, in the industry. <laughs> but it's still really slow. And I, I will be reading it, you know, a year from now, I'll be reading it to audiences and I'll be I'll be different. So it makes sense. It makes sense that I that I would want to update it to match where I'm at right now. And maybe it's not even 
maybe it's not even significant. Maybe it's just something of the art of of the form of the art and how it takes, like how closely it's related to character and narrative and how, how closely we're mirrored um, just as humans through the, through the, the evolution of a character's transformation, like how, how we mirror neurons, (laughs) how we look, how we look at human, human transformation and, and um, project upon it and look on it. Like maybe it's not those changes that I will make may not be significant to anyone, but, but me, but it's a way that I feel like I can, or a writer I'll, would relate in a personal way to that character as the creator, maybe. Or maybe it's just a security ba- blanket move where you just feel like. <laughs> <laughs> like oh, or it's just like a little itch. I mean, it's interesting because that kind of brings me into wanting to talk about the book itself, because this process in some ways is mirrored in the the character's journey. Um, right who is undergoing an enormous transformation herself. I mean, I think all of them are, but Lillian in particular, the main character, is in a totally different position in the beginning of the book than where she ends up going. Right. I don't know. She carries that journey for all of us as we're reading, this desire Mm -hmm. to change and to refine and to shift Mm -hmm. her experience and to really edit it a little bit. And yeah. Let's just say more about Lillian. Let's start there. Lillian, lovely Lillian. She's just trying so hard uh, to do it all right. She's really, she sees, she's smart. She's talented. Like it was important for me that Lillian not become um, too funny or too too silly or too, like she's, you know, she's socially anxious. She has some anxiety. Uh, she's a loner. She's a little bit of a weirdo. She's an artist. She's a weirdo. She's always been a little bit of a weirdo. Not a ton of friends. Um, and and has done a lot of work on herself. By the time we meet her in this book, she has done a lot of work on herself. She's done a lot of self-help. She's done some therapy. She's done some, she's gone, gone to all the right places, seen all the right people, and like knows what's good for her. She really knows herself, and she knows what's good for her, and it's it has to do with her art practice. And being a good person and being like a solid, being a, a responsible citizen, a good friend. Like she really cares about other people. She wants to be good to herself. She's like trying so hard, you know. Um, so hard. She's trying so hard. And there, and therein is, is the difficulty, is her challenge, right? She's just trying so hard all the time. It's hard for any life to get in there. There's hard for, it's hard for any real um it's hard for her to see her own strengths because she she doesn't she doesn't pause and linger on them. She just goes to the next thing she can improve. She sees her evolution is within reach. She sees and she sees like transformed people everywhere, especially on Instagram, and uh, compares herself to them and just always knows there's another level. So you know, you gotta love her. <laughs> yeah, I. I- it was it was fascinating. It felt a little bit like I don't know why this word is popping into mind because it wasn't when I was reading it until now as we're talking about it. But it felt like Lillian is kind of doing bonsai on herself. Mm. Where it's like, I'm gonna form myself into this perfect tree where every single little branch is deliberately arranged. And awesome that's metaphor. how it looks. And I might have to take that. Next. Take I it. might have to. I might have to bite. I have to, might have to bite that if anyone asks. <laughs> How to describe her? That's exactly, exactly it. And it feels like there's some harm, like some unnatch, some harm in that. Some self harm is being done in the constant crafting. Yeah, I mean, in reading it, I was in the first because she does, you know, she does kind of it lifts a little bit as the process goes on. But in the beginning, it was, I wondered how it was for you writing it. Because for me, I was like, oh, my God, is this is a little bit my internal monologue. I mean, I'm a Virgo, I think about but I'm like, oh, my God, it was like me turned up to like a 12. Yeah, or maybe even like a 19, to be honest. Yeah. We're gonna, it's like way above um, Spinal Tap. But it was yeah, that sense of like, oh, my God, this is where it can go. Because it was very much like shown back at you. Because when you're inside of it, like, oh, I should snap a picture of this and post it. This is a nice moment. Or should I not post it? Or how do I feel about that? Or how does that change the moment? Like all of these kinds of thought processes. It seems like not that intense when you're just having them casually. But seeing it on the page made it a completely different experience. Right. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, it's funny you say turned up to 12 cause I wanted to like, what I kept thinking was I was turning everything up to 11, turning everything up to 11. Of course there's a character named 11, which I like was turning it. I was like, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's way higher than 11. Right. Because I think we're all turned up to 11. I think just the normal default, like with, I mean, I'm saying we're all, I know my husband doesn't go on Facebook, but in my, <laughs> in my group, not all of us, I don't think all of us, but I think all of us who I, who we all see on social media of whatever form, we're all of us there because that's all we ever see. So that's like, we have this idea that that's all of us. Um, yeah, I think slowing it down, slowing it down, it was excruciating to write. I can imagine. I was like, how, I, I had this vision of you sitting there kind of writing these things and I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, everyone will get what we're talking about when yeah. you read it. It's so clear, it's like page one, it's there. Yeah, oh, I know it's so uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. I was so uncomfortable. I can just say that I was really uncomfortable and um, trying to have fun. So my 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 fresh air through the discomfort was always reminding myself this should be fun. This should be fun. Have fun with it. Have fun with it. So I. Uh, because it's not it's excruciating only in its in its like constant unrelenting small uh self neurotic self reflection it's not you know it's not uncomfortable and and excruciating in terms of like there being like writing about horrible violence right. it's like the it's the suffering of the small consistent endless checking you're checking yourself. It reminded me a little bit. Um, I don't know. I read this a long time ago, but it was in in David Foster Wallace's brief interviews with Hideous Men. There was one short story in there about the patient, and it was a man who had a level of self reflection that was just. And yeah. he was he was quite a bit more narcissistic than Lillian is. But right. it was an entire short story of him yeah. kind of twisting up his internal psychological processes yeah and yeah. I was like oh boy like yeah. this is a head to be inside of for a story yeah and somewhat easier I mean in, in a very 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 early draft very early like years ago draft Lillian was more narcissistic and it was so much easier for me to write it that way honestly um mm. in, in an early draft because I could like not get involved in a way. Right. I could make, I could make fun. I could like get my frustrations out. I could, I was separating, a, um, I, I wasn't, I didn't love her, uh, in that, in that version. I didn't love her the way I needed to. I was like, Oh, Lillian, like get over yourself. Right. And, and, um, it wasn't working for that reason. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't working for her to be so narcissistic. I feel such tenderness towards her. And, um, I think, uh, you know, there's another there's another book that was really inspiring to me in a later draft by Patrick Rothfuss. Um, he wrote this really strange, small book um, outside of his trilogy. He's a fantasy writer, um, and he has this trilo this this famously unfinished trilogy. He's got the first two books, can't write the third, and instead of writing the third, he wrote this small book called The Silent Regard. Oh, The Slow Regard of Silent Things, I think is the is the title. Mm. And it takes place in the same world of his of this fantasy world, but there's only one character in the novel and she she picks up things she very neurotically and lovingly <laughs> um and and stresses out about in an, it, it's obsess it's I think she has OCD. I think this is like an illustration of a character with OCD. It's a wonderful exploration of it. She like takes objects and has to find the right place for them in the space. And she'll pick up an object and then put it there. And it's not in the right space. It's not right. It's not right. And the, the stress, the like exertion about it not being in the right space. And then she puts it in another space. And it sounds so strange to, to write about it. Honestly, it's just about her. This book is about her quest with objects and, and placing them in the house, in her little house. And, underground in this fantasy world um and the book is so moving it's and it, and it read it if you take a look at it yeah. if you haven't it's it, it just shows the interior world of this character's um this, this character's interior world and her mind and how it goes over things and touches things over and over and over and i i did read that um like a, about a year ago or a year and a half ago and it like unlocked something in me of like oh maybe it's actually i was so moved by this book i thought maybe it's actually Maybe it's okay to go into this amount of detail. Maybe this is actually the important thing. Because it does feel a little bit, I mean, it did 
from like in early, we can talk about this later, maybe if you want, but there in, in the second draft, when I finished it and I looked it over, I did wonder, am I allowed to write about all of these minuscule details of a woman's life, like her interior world? Like is, is anybody going to care about so, so many small details of a woman's, of this woman's thoughts? And then I was like, well, there's David Foster Wallace, there's like Jonathan Franz, and there's um, like there are writers who write, who, who do this, who like write this, because like, this book is long, right? It's long. I mean, it's, it's not crazy long. It's not Dostoevsky long, but, but it's a, it's a all hefty. The publishers keep telling me how long it is. <laughs> uh, they all, all the publishers in all the countries are like, it's a really long book, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting to me because it doesn't take long to read. No, it doesn't. It's pretty. Mm-hmm. I mean, it moves right along, and it's not one of those interior world books where you're just sitting in a room, and it's not like Bertolt nope. Brecht or something where she's nope. pacing across the room, going, "What am I doing? What am I doing?" No, there's not at real all. action happening and things going on, and she's just aware of it. It's like I can use the novel to show something about our attention. The form of the novel really let me do that. Like I could take I could take you through I could stretch time and show what attention and focus, like what's happening to it. I could show what's happening to Lillian's attention and focus through the pages of a novel um, and play with time that way. Uh, and I think the novel is probably the the it was the best place for me to do it for me to show this actual thing, like the, the turning of pages to show how much space it takes up. Like it really needs to take up space, I guess, to show how much space it's taking up in our otherwise beautiful minds. <laughs> yes. I mean, I wonder if that's part of it too, is that you're, you're doing something really tricky and kind of, um, I don't want to say insidious, but I think fairly, really clever, which is you're taking a world like, this woman who's an artist and has to promote herself, you know, in the beginning, and then she kind of explores other options. But a lot of us very strictly separate the world of, say, Mm -hmm. reading a novel and the world of being online Mm -hmm. and the world of short attention spans, quick snaps, you know, short little paragraphs that are real pithy (laughs) under your photograph, and you're putting them together And I think it's forcing the reader to look at what that means in their own life. Mm. And you're (laughs) used to just reading an Instagram post and moving on. So when you have a whole novel where that isn't it the whole time, but it's, it's present, I think it does feel like, wow, okay, there's something different happening here. And it's forcing us to look Mm -hmm. at what's becoming of our lives as a result of how much time we spend doing these things, which Mm -hmm. nobody was even capable of doing five or 10 years ago. No, right? Right? It couldn't have happened five years ago. And like you read novels that were written five or 10 years ago and they're different. Like the feeling is so different. It's so different. Time is so different now for, I feel, I feel like time is just. No, I agree. Yeah. And through the years that I spent writing this novel, a lot has happened. So where I started and where, and what has happened in um, culturally, just techno- just in technology, I mean, but yeah, culturally also. But <laughs> um, what's happened in those world in in um, the years in between the start and finish has uh, ch- changed. It changed the times the time span of the book. I meant the book when I started the book. I was writing something that was going to be happening in the near future. Mm. <clears throat> so I wanted it to be something that was like maybe next year, like whatever. I was not going to date the book and I was going to make it like sometime next year, like sort of an imagine, like turning it up to 11 again, like imagining, like given where we are right now, imagine what could happen if we really took this far. Mm. And as I wrote it, all that stuff happened. Right. Like it, it, and then some. So like, I was like, you know, this consciousness, like this whole consciousness thing, what if they started putting crystals into face cream? Like, what if we started putting, like, what if we, yeah, they are, they're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> what if we started meditating into our food and the, med- and the like vibrations, the vibrations from that energetic, like the energetic vibe from that went into the chocolate and that became part of what you're ingesting. Yeah, we're doing that. Like that's happening. Conscious chocolate's happening. Like it's all that, <laughs> that I'm kind of veering off the original thing. I'm, I'm no, taking it's a good. Tangent. It's good. Um, 
all to say I had to make the book. I decided that to make the, I decided that it was best for the book if it was historical fiction. So instead of keeping it in that open-ended space, um, the, the, every, we're, our consciousness is changing so fast, like with what's happening with our attention span and those bits and pieces of fragmented, our interruptions, it's the constant interruption that we have throughout our day. Um, even if we aren't on our phones being interrupted, generally someone around us is, and that affects us too, I think. So there's always these interruptions happening. So um, that shift has, is happening so fast and I don't even know where it's going. So at the end of 2017, I just went back to the draft and was like, let's just make this historical fiction. I can't take this into 17, 2017 and beyond. I can't, I, this is a 2000, this is what it was like in 2016. And like, <laughs> this is historical fiction. We're going to look back on this. And you know what? Maybe we look back on in 2018 readers in 2018 and 2019. It might be super nostalgic, like reading about something from the eighties. 2016 is like so long ago <laughs> <laughs> when Beyonce came out with lemonade. That's so funny. I, I, I remembered you having said it, I don't know, in my mind, I had a different memory. So it's interesting to hear you say this, that it was maybe going to be in 2017. But so much political stuff happened all over yeah. that there was no yeah. way to not include it. But I guess yeah. when you were first writing it, 2017 was the near future. So there's oh, yeah. this weird time yes. warp that happens with how long oh, it takes gosh. to write and publish a book. It's such a time warp. It's really difficult. I mean, I wanted to write a contempt, like a, a satire that takes place that is a commentary. This was my in initial start, like in 2013, when I, well, 2012, when I first started sketching the ideas. And then when I really got down to this version was about 2014, I'd say that I started first started writing these scenes that, that you're reading the remnant, the, the revised versions of now. 2014, I was looking at this book being like, hmm, maybe it takes place in like 2017. <laughs> <laughs> and no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Like I once with what was happening politically. And I mean, this was before, before, I mean, before me too, before all the things like all this, the, this, all of this change, I couldn't tell this story the way I wanted to tell this story, which is very much about, um, attention and focus and art and commerce and uh, sales and marketing and friendship, um, all of those things. I wanted to just focus on those themes, and I mean, the themes could get. I could. I could have made this book something else, but those were. That's the story that I wanted to tell. So I, I had to, I had to turn off the news and just go back to two, to 2016. So with the the first part of 2017, I was living in 2016. I like printed out all the calendars. I did all the research. I like looked at all the events that were happening in the world, like what storms were happening in the world in 2016, what like what was the weather like, what, what were the phases of the moon like. I was really living back in history. I loved all those little details. I thought it was really <laughs> fun. To, I was like, oh, right, that did happen. Right. Um, it didn't feel like, oh, back in the day at all. And one of the things that really was fascinating to me, and I wondered about this process of writing, it's really fun because reading the book, you know, we've talked about this book twice before, and it felt, I was thinking a little bit like Schrodinger's book up to this point, like it could be any book <laughs> when I got the, the manuscript in the mail. I'm like, all I know about this book is that it was maybe originally going to be set in 2017, and now it's not. It's before right. that. And I knew like little things. But we had talked about the process so much. I was like, this could be any book when I opened the, the cover to start. <laughs> and one of the things that struck me as a person who used to live in the Bay Area and was very much in this kind of, and, and who studied psychology and expressive arts, and you know, I was really in this kind of community of personal growth and, and all of that, were the newsletters that are oh, okay. appearing yeah. you know, periodically. So for those of you listening, the book has a really wonderful technique of going into these newsletters, which I'm sure many of us receive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I or do. Write. I write one. I mean, <laughs> as do you. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, meant to inspire or connect with people. And there was something I was like, oh, God, do I sound like that? <laughs> a little bit because they're sort of inspiring, but it is a satire. And so I'm like, oh, boy. Um, yeah. did you, did you subscribe to a whole bunch of crazy newsletters? Yeah. I just want to know what the process was about the newsletters. Yeah, I subscribed to a bunch of newsletters and I did that thing, which is like read, 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 then forget and write. So like, just like we, I read newspaper newsletters, like I read novels, like 
as part of the research, as part of the like permissive, but part of getting the voices. Cause I have, I think four characters who write different newsletters. So I have like a meditation instructor, um, a, like a life coach, a lifestyle entrepreneur and a visual artist, all trying to like sell their wares, all creating a personal brand, which all of us have to do right now if we're actually going to make any kind of livelihood. It's all about the personal brand, <laughs> unless you have like tenure at a university, like hands clasped for you. That's amazing. <laughs> or you've published but, a thousand, you know, you know, a million books and everybody knows who you are or whatever. But uh, even then, yeah. even if you've published a thousand books, unless they're cookbooks um, mm. or, yeah. or design books, like if they're not, if you've published a thousand novels, it doesn't mean that you're making it. That, that doesn't mean your livelihood. I mean, it means you might have a better shingle to, to hang so that you can do some speaking and live events and, and that could be lucrative, but publishing isn't lucrative. Um, and like sidebar read a really interesting little article by, um, Margaret Atwood about how the hand, she's not making any money from the handmaid's tale that she said, she signed those, <laughs> like there's no, there's no money in that for her at all. The and show. She's there and she was, yeah. The show. No, oh. that was, that's owned by something like that con that contractually went out years and years ago and the rights are someone else's. They're not hers. She doesn't get paid for that. Um, oh. so yeah, like just sort of pulling that veil over just, um, not in a glo doom and gloom way, just like, this is the predicament we're in. This is the opportunity we have. <laughs> this is our challenge, um, is like live being creative and having a livelihood. So yeah, I had to read all these newsletters, um, loved it. It was really interesting. But then what I wanted to do was write the newsletters in the voice of all of these different characters. So each, each being newsletter voice, but each having their own voice. So Juliet is the lifestyle, like the lifestyle blogger. She has a really different voice in her newsletter than uh, Jonathan Rasmussen, the like active meditation teacher. He has a With very different With the New Zealand accent, which was just yeah, exactly. hilarious. Right. <laughs> the New Zealander, the New Zealander living in the States. The seductive New Zealander with his mm, enticing so accent. So cute. <laughs> so embodied, so kinesthetic. Yeah, so I did. I, I subscribed to a bunch of newsletters. Um, I also have a lot of newsletters that I that I willingly want to be reading. Um, but you know, I subscribed to a bunch here. Like I peppered throughout just to see what other people were doing and how it looks. And and I write my own newsletters. I I have a subscriber list. I have um, writing students who I communicate with and have communicated with in that format for you know five years or so by these biweekly newsletters that I had to write. What was really, really really hard. Like, I think the thing that just almost made me give up one or both of these ventures was writing newsletters for my list while writing newsletters for my characters. Oh God. It was awful. It was really, really hard. And you know, nobody read, nobody read the book until I finished the draft. Um, and and Ryan, my, my husband hasn't read, I don't share it until it's very, very into a very finished. I don't share it with Ryan. Cause he's got, you know, Ryan, he's like, <laughs> he has an incredible eye for detail. He's quality control. It's amazing. So until I'm ready for his eye, I don't want him to read it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had, I had to get it into a certain state of finishedness and a pretty clean copy before I gave it to him to read. And, um, when I did, I just was so, I just wanted him to just see, uh, and he just, he read the, he read it and was like, oh, I get why these, why these past two years have been so difficult. Like, oh, <laughs> now I see, cause I would be like, okay, I have to write this newsletter. So in the morning I would spend hours writing fake newsletters that were like, you know, showing the problems of the showing the problems, not, not satirizing completely. Like, there's a lot of good in all of those newsletters that those care. There's a lot of good in, in everything that, um, ev all of them are giving. They're giving a lot. They're generous characters and they're giving a lot in their newsletters, like all of those recipes and crafty patterns and <laughs> all of the, um, all of the meditation advice, all of the like empowerment, inspiration, it's all good stuff. But there's something that happens when it's like, written as a broadcast, not a letter, even when you're writing your letter to it, like it's, it's persuasive marketing copy. Even when it's a letter that's, you're writing your marketing copy, I mean, even just calling it copy, like 
Yeah, uh, it changes it. Like I'm, There's I'm like just this wedding right now. I know, I totally. Know, but how else are we supposed to communicate? Like, how do we communicate it's so with people rough. we communicate with? It's like there's this, it's just a, it's a very subtle tweak, which I can see why it was so difficult because it's, there's this whole, like, I can barely say the word. I'm going to choke it out. But the word, ugh, authentic, it kind of makes me want to yeah. throw up in my mouth a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is sort of the, it, it's like, I feel like the underlying goal in all of the characters in the book is to achieve this level authentic or whatever but (laughs) but in the in attempting to achieve authentic you've already lost it yeah yeah and that's what's fascinating to me is following all these people who are on the one level incredibly self-aware but on the other hand like completely tone deaf yeah and and is that what we're becoming? Which in many ways, I think we may. And it's not like, I agree, like a lot of the things in all of those newsletters are positive. They're like, do nice things with your family or yeah. take a moment to take a breath, all of which are yeah. great things to do. Yeah. And at the same time, there's just so much of it that mm-hmm. um, I remember the feeling when I was in in grad school for, for psychology. And I think I got to the point where I ultimately had to move away from San Francisco because mm-hmm. I felt like there has to be a balance between living and then processing your experience. <laughs> yeah. And when you come and do a, you can get addicted to processing, which I think in some ways is what I, I was feeling yeah. referenced in the book is that you, you live for a long time and then you discover this process of like looking underneath the layers and the, the compost heave, which is the most amazing term. And um, <laughs> which is a process the, the characters go through when they're having an emotional upheaval. Um <laughs> And, and and it feels really good to do. It feels because in many situations, people live their whole lives without being allowed to exactly. have an emotional reaction. Exactly, and that's not healthy. No, but right? all neither is constantly <laughs> having an emotional reaction to everything. <laughs> and I think that that's what um, I got trapped in when I was studying psychology was this sense of like it was somehow more meaningful to have these reactions to things happening, and it mm-hmm. was like the other end of the pendulum. Yeah. Which I feel like yeah. is what the novel is warning us about. Like, yeah. you have it's to so live seductive. as much as you process. Yeah, it's so seductive. The processing seductive. It also is like such a point of connection in a, in a, like opening up. It's like how we are vulnerable, like this, like being vulnerable, you know, that this like, um, sh- opening up and showing that to a, a group of people who then accept you and all of your vulnerability, like that is like, I think that lights stuff up in our brain that just feels like, um, really hard to live without, like very lonely to live without that. Yeah. It's like, it's like a drug. Yeah. And then you're like, well, you can't go back to, you know, like when she goes back to visit, um, because Lillian moves to New York and is part of this community. And then she goes back to visit and it's like, these people aren't, they don't get it now, but it's, it's this, you kind of have to get to this point where you're looking at yourself in a certain way, but not expecting the rest of the world. It's like trying to pave the whole world with leather, you know, once you go into one of these communities and it's like, she has a hard time relating to other people, which I think does happen. It totally Mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. And it's all in the name of connection. Like it's what, I think it's what every character is looking for in the book is connection. Um, So it's all in that it's all in the name of connection, but what happens is like more, more strange sort of a perverse connection or like alienation ultimately. Um, when the connection is like (sighs) focused on how you're not okay without it. Yes. And also when it's a performance and you have to do it in (laughs) a certain way. Right. Like that was, that was something that I really saw in like Juliet's newsletters in particular was this, I have this relationship and here are my two children and they're making Valentines and here is this moment between them. And it, it's all really lovely and it feels very cultivated Yeah, in a way that then other people looking in start to think, well, my life isn't that nice. Yeah. But it's great because you see that Juliet's life isn't perfect either. Um, Right. But yet there's this feeling, um, I mean, it reminds me of someone living in Los Angeles, like the way you are sort of, the way it's considered important to put yourself together and present yourself in a certain way. And women aren't allowed to get older in, you know, visually Mm -hmm. and all of these things. There's a little bit of that in this too, which is not necessarily about plastic surgery, but it feels a little bit like emotional plastic surgery that people have to go through. Oh, that's really interesting. That's so interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, because it's not plastic surgery. It's about loving yourself as you are. <laughs> <laughs> but loving yourself as you are in a very particular way. I know. And I could it's be just so a tricky. T- like 2% more lovable if I had this blanket and sofa to lie on in my photographs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine the book groups that are going to be unfurled from this. I wonder, you know, like um, the... I'm, I'm even hesitant to bring this up now because I just, I don't, I, I don't, I haven't spoken this through yet, but you know, there, one of the questions I got asked in the editing process, um, from my great editors, uh, New York and Toronto editors, both of them were so solid. And, and one of the questions they asked is at, at the beginning stages was what's the, what's the takeaway here, Sarah? Like, what are you saying? What are you saying about marketing? Mm. What are you saying? Um, and, and it, it, being asked that question in that way um, was really frustrating to me because I feel like I just said it. Like <laughs> what I'm saying about marketing is what you just read. Like that's what I'm saying about marketing. This feeling that we're having is what I'm saying, um, which is it's uncomfortable. It's not like I don't know if there's a way out. I don't think the way out is not having a newsletter list. Obviously, I don't think that. Like I don't think that's the way out. I don't think the way out is not being present on Instagram ever. I, I, like this is where we are. We're living online now. This is where we're going. This is where we are. This is where we're going. We need to create, we need to craft a life there. I am saying, I think between the lines, <laughs> I think I'm saying that I'm an, I'm nostalgic. Like I'm a little sad that the word authentic causes us to barf in our mouth now. Like I, that that's a little sad, right. but I also feel like the word authentic is not the con it's not authenticity. The word authentic is something that marketing can co-opt. Marketing can co-opt a lot of things. Marketing is co-opting the word story. M- marketing is co-opting, like, you know, it's it's all kind of looping into economics. Um, and it's really powerful. And as we have these channels, these, like, personal, small, like, infinitely craftable channels to um, market ourselves, it's it's so pervasive and it's so powerful that we need to, we need to protect what's, what's real outside of, well, lang- language, ultimately right. Out- outside of language. As a writer, I know it's a little bit strange to get to that place, but that's the place, that's a place. And it, and we can't because language is like, we're, we can't get away from currency <laughs> and our current economic system. We're in it and we can't get away from language. This is how we speak and communicate. And yet, and yet, by knowing there's a space that's outside of that system, um, I think that we can find some solace there. We can find some magic there. And we can find company there. And I think that that's what happens, for instance, like when we write together, like in a class, when people are writing together. We're all using language, but we're not, we're not using language in that way. We're creating. I think creative energy is a space that exists outside of that system. Art does. I think so, too. I think that's do so you? important. Yeah, I do. Because I think... One of the things that it's reminding is the beauty of doing something without having an aim in mind. Right. And I think that, you know, no matter how um, kind of touchy feely one gets in writing for a business, I mean, I think that's the thing that I'm nostalgic for is you're talking about the things that you're nostalgic for. Mm-hmm. There is this place, I think everyone is somewhat uncomfortable with self promotion. Everybody is. Mm-hmm. And I think that we used to kind of come out and say it, you know, these ads, like I'm thinking of like crazy Eddie, come buy my stuff. (laughs) I got a lot of cheap stuff. You want cheap stuff? Here it is. Like it was very, it was very straightforward. And if you, you know, like here's the phone number, come buy a car. Like if you want a car, here's where you go. And now it's like, here I am with the wind in my hair and I'm driving in a beautiful Mm -hmm. car and it's really wonderful and I'm having a beautiful Saturday. How's your Saturday? And it's like, they still want you to buy a car, but they're not coming out and saying it. And I think that there's something about language that becomes slippery in those moments. And it's like, like you said, we think we can get out of that, that kind of feeling of, I have a, I have an agenda here. I have an ultimate agenda. And maybe I can dress it up real pretty and then it won't feel weird to me that I'm doing this. But I kind of right. miss when people didn't feel weird about it. They were just like, I got a car. Come on down if you want to buy it. Right. <laughs> right. Right. It's loud, but it's not icky. It's loud, but it's like, yeah, like come, 
here's the bolts, like in the Victorian days, like here's your bolts of fabric. This is where you're going to buy calico, <laughs> calico fabric for dresses. Come on down. Right, here's where it's like, get your flour and salt and sugar. <laughs> like I make boots. Um, you need boots. Come to the boot maker. And I, there's only three kinds. Yeah. Pick the one you like, you and know. It, and so much. I mean, I'm just thinking about the, um, the brand, like the, the brand models, like the, um, the brand ambassadors or just Instagrammers who make money Instagramming by shooting their lifestyle and then having product placement in their like camper van or their, or their you, you know, know their twisted trip, up blanket trip to Bali. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean like, and then it's all tagged with all the shops. Like that's tricky. That's really tricky stuff. And it's coming on the same channel. Like it's not an, it's not an out, it's not a sponsored ad on Instagram. It's actually someone you are aligned with in some way and you're looking at in some way like it's yeah it's no, advanced. I know. and I hesitate to even bring this up but I'm just going to drop it in and then and then I'm going to walk away um is this article uh-huh. that came up on the Guardian that I was just reading yesterday about the guy who helped create Steve Bannon's um machine and they were looking at how opinions correlate to political opinion and how you can start to twist that on these channels so I will link to the article and I will let people draw their own conclusions. Yeah. But um, okay. I will say that I couldn't even get all the way through it because I was like, oh, I need a minute. This is language, right? Because it's like la- like language and image and persuasion slash manipulation. Yeah. And all of the things that we can, you know, you, it starts outside of you, but you, as we can see with Lillian, you bring it inside of yourself. You choose like, yeah, you do. this is a better yeah. way to be. I'm going to take this on. And she's, yeah. she's you know, doing it to herself. She's making little mini choices. Oh, I shouldn't think this negative thought. Oh, I I need to take a breath. I need to do this. This is better. This is better. This is better again Mm -hmm. and again. Mm -hmm. And I think she's an excellent example of where we can go with this and how we need to... It's it's so insidious because then you start to say like take care of ourselves and you're like oh my god this is such a buzz phrase like how can I get away from buzz (laughs) phrases? It sort of makes me think of um, the movie Mosquito Coast. Do you remember this one? Yeah. where, where, (laughs) Where they try to build this idyllic space in this utopic yeah where they'd have no money and it, it's just like and it's Harrison Ford like all cracked out with River Phoenix as his son I remember yeah. loving this movie as a kid love this movie yeah and it's like just just get away from all of it and yeah, that I know. and yet even there like commerce starts to creep in at the end and it changes yeah. everything yeah I know commerce changes everything I know I don't think there's there's a there's a wonderful book. I like there's a wonderful book by um, Pima Chodron called The Wisdom of No Escape. Oh, so good. Um, so good. And I think that try, I think that trying anything that divides or anything that is escape, like I think the true wisdom there is in seeing what it like seeing what actually is, which is yes, there's commerce. Like yes, yes, there's money involved, and yes, there's. Um, uh, the words can you like escaping is not it getting out just choosing one over the other is never there's always shadow in the light and there's always um light in the shadow and knowing that this is in coexistence and that i think like as creative beings that's our i think that's our way i think everyone is a creative has like some creativity and that it's making stuff it's making stuff without um as you said without like having to sell it or have an end result even, or having to be finished. Just like making the process of making is, um, it doesn't, it doesn't exist on either side of that divide. It's, um, that's the, that's the sweet spot. That's the good spot. It's like being. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's the ultimate Mm -hmm. goal. Well, I could easily go on for like another three hours, but I know. I'm just like, oh, so we're just like, I know. I'm like, maybe we should start a whole separate show and just talk about this all the time. But I'm so glad <laughs> that we got to have this conversation. And I'm so thrilled that we, we've we had you for the third and that you're here and it's episode 100 and that the book is coming out and that other people can read it. Yeah. Congratulations on your 100th episode. And thank you so much. Thank you for such a great conversation about this book. Like, it's really fun to talk to you about it um, because of who you are and what you do, like where you're uniquely located um, in life and work and creativity. It's like, I'm, I'm so pleased to talk to you about this book. Well, I'm always pleased to talk to you. Thank you so much. (laughs) 
I want to take a quick second to talk about this week's sponsor, Audible. I wanted to give you a suggestion of a book you can listen to with your free trial and your free credit that you get at secretlibrarypodcast.com slash audible. Since we're at the very end of April, I wanted to share one of my favorite audiobooks, which is The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. And this book is read by Nadia May. It is a beautiful story for anyone who's just been through a really cold, dark, wet winter. It's about four women in England who come from various backgrounds, various circumstances, and feel really stuck, and rent a castle together in Italy for the month of April, and their lives are transformed as a result. It's one of the most optimistic and happy reads that I try to read the book or listen to the audiobook or watch the film every year in April. So we've got a few days left in April. If you visit secretlibrarypodcast.com slash audible and check out the trial, you can get a copy of The Enchanted April and listen for yourself. Okay, enjoy that, and let's get back to the show. Another treat to give you in this episode is the wonderful Mary Laura Philpot, who you all will know both from her episode discussing her book, Penguins with People Problems, also for other segments she's done on the show, very generously sharing all the books that she's read and loved the most in recent memory. So pretty much every couple months, I just want to talk to Mary Laura about what she's reading. So she has agreed to come on and blab with us about books, as she puts it. And as an Emmy Award winning uh, co-host of the interview show, A Word on Words, she is possibly the most qualified person I know to recommend books. So get out your notepad or make sure you visit the show notes to get the full list of books that she recommends because I've already read some of them since recording this, and they were all pure gold. Every one I've picked up, every book she's told me to read and I've read, it's pure gold. So here we go with Mary Laura Philpott's amazing book recommendations for this season. Hey, Mary Laura, this has become kind of a an exciting little segment we've been doing periodically, even though you and I can't come up with a name for it. Um, <laughs> Anyone listening, if you have a name for this book, show and tell, Mary Laura and I do periodically, please submit them. Yeah. It's like we're going steady on a podcast quarterly. (laughs) (laughs) It's a quarterly podcast date where we show books to each other on the video that no one can see, but you get to hear about (laughs) it. And sometimes we take pictures of them and you get to, that's right. You get to see them later. So we did the January excitement, um, the January excitement of books. I subsequently went to the bookstore and blew a bunch of money on books. And good work. then, yeah, I know it was good. Of course, I haven't had time to read them yet, but they're sitting there looking pretty. And uh, I'm ready to do it again. I'm ready to Yay. do it again. Okay. Do you want to do fiction or nonfiction first? What mood are you in today? I, I trust you. I, I want to be. Okay. I, I think you should go with what you want to leave. Okay. With. Well, let's do let's do fiction first, yes. and then we'll do nonfiction. And if I start running on too long and I need to hurry up, you know, just make the sign of my face. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think what we will start with, and I don't have this one to hold it up and show you because I just gave my copy to someone last night. It is Circe by Madeline Miller, mm. who wrote Song of Achilles. And I may be pronouncing that wrong. I don't, like my ancient Greek pronunciation is not... Perfect, probably. Maybe it's Kirky, maybe it's Cirque, but it's C I R C E. I think the Game of Thrones and, pronunciation is acceptable right. to most people. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll go with that. So everybody is crazy about this book in much the same way that they were crazy about Madeline Miller's last book, Song of Achilles. And I have to admit that I dragged my feet a little bit on reading this one because I have just never been that much of a fan of mythology. Like, I could in school I could never keep my gods and goddesses straight and it just the mythology and ancient literature units in school always felt really dry to me and mm. confusing um and that is exactly what makes this book so astonishing so it's not confusing it's not dry she takes these names that you know from classic literature in this case it's Circe from the story of Odysseus in the Odyssey and she fills in the gaps and she explains what everyone's motivations were. What, why did Cersei do the things she did? Why did she end up banished to an island where she turned men into pigs? Why did she sleep with Odysseus? How does this old 
story, which is kind of a sexist story the way it was told the first time, if you tell it a new way, have something to say about how we live today. It's just what she pulls off in this book is really astonishing. And so I was, I was excited. Like it, I love the feeling of pleasant surprise when you go mm. into something and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to like it. And then you love it. So um, there's a really great interview coming up on our bookstore website, Parnassus Musing. And it should be out by the time this airs. It's coming out next week. And it's an interview of Madeline Miller by our guest interviewer, Victoria Schwab. <gasps> Yeah, who's the best-selling fantasy writer. And our uh, most popular podcast guest ever. There you go. Okay, well, Victoria <laughs> is interviewing Madeline, which, you know, Perfect. Once, if you think about it, they both write about monsters, just True. in different ways. So they have a lot to talk about, so check that out. Um, and here's our fun fact about that book. So our very, when Parnassus Books opened and started its first editions club, which is our, like, book subscription thing, um our very first book pick was Song of Achilles. Mm. And our pick for April this year is Circe. And it's the first time we've ever repeated an author. Really? So, that is high, go. high praise indeed. Right? Right? Okay, next oh, one. Oh, God, I feel a bookstore trip coming on. I, <laughs> get ready. Save your money. Okay, next one. <laughs> Meg Wolitzer. Meg mm. Wolitzer has a new one. It's called The Female Persuasion. It has a fabulous cover that I would totally wear as a dress or yeah, a top. It's kind of, it's kind of um, like a Swedish or a Finnish textile looking. Mm -hmm. it's, a very, it, it's a good looking book and it's just as good on the inside. It's one of those books you can really dig into. It follows one person from youth through adulthood. And in that sense, it's very classic and traditional. But it's also really contemporary in that... The main character in this book is a woman, and the central relationship in the book is the relationship between this woman and an older woman who becomes her mentor in mm. work and life. So you kind of go through the decades after they meet. They meet when this girl is in college and this older woman comes to speak, and she's, um, she's just enthralled and inspired. And so you go through the decades and follow their relationship and how, how they've impacted each other. So it's it's about big, timeless things like destiny and decisions and how one person can change another person's life. But it also feels really of the moment. It's a very, it's very timely. Probably every single review will say, this book is so timely because it is. <laughs> um, and we're working on an interview right now with Meg. So nice. stay tuned for, for that one on our site as well. Fun. Uh, more fiction. Oh, here's one. Okay. We, t we briefly mentioned this last time. Curtis Sittenfeld's upcoming oh, book. Oh, yes. You think it, I'll say it. Um, Great my cover friend, also. It also. And look at the covers together. Don't they kind of look like the letters from one were cut out of the cover of the other? Yes. We've got a, a brightly colored with mm -hmm. white lettering on the Meg Willitzer. We've got a white cover with almost the same color bright lettering on the Curtis right? Sittenfeld. Very good looking together. So my <laughs> nice is a this, set. Nice is a set. Uh, my friend KJ is a big reader, and she told me recently that she almost never reads short stories because, in her experience, short stories are always super. I think, in her exact words, were they're always super dark and serious and no fun. So you know, in Ferris Bueller, when he jumps up on the parade float and he goes, "This goes out to a young man who doesn't think he's seen anything good today." <laughs> This book goes out to my friend KJ, who thinks short stories can't be any fun. Nice. Um, it's fun. It's great. It's Curtis Sittenfeld, great writer, really engaging. This is kind of a can't go wrong, buy it and take it on spring break, buy it and have it with you for the summer kind of book. And uh, of course, as we discussed last time, the book is being turned into a TV series. Very exciting. So this is part of the, the empire of Reese Witherspoon. She's going to be producing it and it is going to star Kristen Wiig. Oh, Isn't that cool? So fun. I know. I think it's going to be on Apple. Does Apple have TV shows? It may now. Is that right? I mean, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. Right. That would certainly be that would certainly be a way to kick it off. Um, so make sure you get that one. Um, we're Reese Witherspoon is all over the book adaptations right now with it's Celeste Ings. Um, mm -hmm. Little fires little everywhere. Fires. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go Reese. I know. Way to champion I love the it. books. Yeah, way to get behind these authors who are coming up with the good stories. 
um, kind of zigzagging all over the place in terms of types of books. Do you read thrillers? Are you a thriller? Yes, I do. Okay. So I I have one to tell you about, but. You do? I do, but you go first. Maybe it's the same one. It might be. Is it Sometimes I Lie? No. (gasps) Okay. So I am not so much a thriller person. I feel like if I read one really good one that like gives me heart attacks, I'm good for about a year (laughs) and then I can read another one. And all my fellow booksellers at Parnassus know this about me. So when we get in galleys of thrillers, they do not usually pass them to me, but every now and then they'll pull one out and go, okay, if you're just going to do one, do this one. It's going to give you the vapors. Right. You're going to stay up all night and sorry. So this is called, I don't have it with me because again, I gave it away, but it's called Sometimes I Lie. Mm. And it is by a British writer named Alice Feeney. And it's very satisfying. It has all the fun, all the fun crazy that you want in a thriller. It's got the woman who narrates it is in a coma and you don't know how she got into the coma and she's Mm. trying to figure out if her husband had something to do with it. From it's inside the coma. From, she's narrating from inside a coma. And then there are chapters where we're getting to read a childhood diary. And there mm. are creepy memories there. And you just know some twist is coming, but you don't know what it is. It's just, it's everything that you want in a thriller. Nice. It just, it kind of, you know, jerks you around in all the good ways. So that's my thriller recommendation. You probably won't get another thriller <laughs> recommendation from me. <laughs> So that's the one. I will take it then. Yeah. Wait, I want to know what yours is. Well, I read, um, I just had them on the show. Um, I love this whole, I think I loved it even more. I, I started reading it. It's called The Sandman by Lars Kepler. It's a, it's in translation from Swedish. Okay. And the thing that I love about it, it's really, I mean, I read thrillers fairly regularly, but mm-hmm. it my husband had already gone to sleep when I started reading it. And then I was like, and couldn't fall asleep. Like just from like the first three chapters, it's pretty scary, but it's really well done. And the characters are really well developed and interesting. And so, um, but the thing that I love is that Lars Kepler is actually a husband and wife team that were independently published novelists. And they created, they wanted to work together because they thought that writing books alone was really lonely. And so they created this character named Lars Kepler who wrote, and I said, does Lars Kepler have an identity? And they said, oh, yes. And they told me all about who he was and he works for like a nonprofit (laughs) during the day. And he, but he has this dream of writing fiction. And so he writes it at night, like after he does, or no, maybe he does the, like a, he works in like a homeless shelter at night and writes his fiction during the day. But it was like a fully developed character even beyond that. And so they're telling stories on two levels. They're telling the totally. thriller and then they're telling the story of the imaginary guy that writes the thriller. Yes, That's exactly. That's fantastic. It's so great. And they're so like they're so kind and sweet. And they come up Aww. with these diabolical stories, um, <laughs> which I also loved. And I, yeah. I don't know, the whole psychological level, too, of like, in Sweden, everything is so happy and we don't have very much crime. And all of this crazy dark stuff comes out of Sweden <laughs> because they said, well, maybe we feel safe to explore the darker side of human nature here in literature. So right. it has to come out somewhere. Let it come out in books. That's a safer place for it. Yeah. And and the other thing I liked is that one of the protagonists, like the, the cops, is a woman who's really does the hardcore sort of heavy lifting of the investigation. So nice. I really liked that about it also. Nice. Okay. Thrillers. All right. That's it for thrillers. Yep. One we more, covered them. One, we did it. One more fiction book before we go on to nonfiction. One more novel. This is called Self-Portrait with Boy by I Rachel Fyne. I keep Fyan. hearing about this one. It snuck up on me. I did not read it before it was out. I actually bought it off the bookstore shelves, and that almost never happens um, with me. And it was fun to be able to find something on the shelf that I hadn't read this is a great read for anybody who loved The Woman Upstairs by Claire Massoud or Woman Number 17 mm-hmm. by Eden Lepucky. It's not, not that it's exactly like either of those, but it deals in the same themes. So it's about a young photographer. She's just trying to get her artistic career started. And she embarks on this daily project in which she takes a self-portrait using a remote control camera, just herself in front of her apartment window every day and she's going to create this series and she doesn't really know what she's going to do with it but somehow this this seems like something she can sell maybe so one day she's shooting her daily photo for this series and she happens to catch a moment on film that she was not intending to catch a body falls past her window 
So when she develops the picture, it, she's got a picture of her leaping in the air in front of her window and a body falling in the air behind her window. And it turns out to be this artistically perfect photograph. Like it's the photo that if she sold it to a gallery, it would make her career, it would get her out of debt. It would turn her whole life around. But it turns out that she also knows the person who fell and she knows their family. Obviously they live in her apartment building and she has to decide. It becomes this whole moral dilemma about deciding what to do with this photograph. And it, so the book gets into questions of ambition and scruples and what we owe other people. Like, what do you owe your friends? What do you owe your family? What do you owe your neighbors? What do you owe strangers? Really, really good. Mm. Really a fun book. So I, that was one that snuck up on me, and I was so glad it did because I couldn't put it down. Nice. I wanted to know what she was going to do. And at first, like if you had told me that dilemma, I would say, obviously, only a lunatic would sell that photo. That's just terrible. But Rachel Lyon really does a good job of building up both sides of the case mm. for why maybe she would and why maybe she wouldn't. So that's that. Nice. Okay. Nonfiction. Nonfiction. Oh, so, so much good nonfiction. Okay. Mm, this, I've been reading a lot too. Have you? It's, it's a good time for it. It's a good time for memoir. Mm-hmm. This is one of my favorite, favorite books of the moment. It's called And Now We Have Everything mm-hmm. by Megan O'Connell. comes out at the beginning of April. So you know how there's a school of thought that says you have to earn the right to write a memoir by living through something freakishly rare or accomplishing something huge? Right. You know? I've had pe- like I've had people tell me this as as if this is common book selling wisdom. Like if you're a celebrity, you can write about what you had for breakfast and you'll sell a million million copies. And if you're a nobody but you got abducted by aliens, you can sell a million copies. But if you're a nobody and you just live a regular life, nobody wants to read your memoir and you have no business writing memoir and you should not be writing about your life. And I mm. disagree. I disagree with that. I a do lot. too. I really do. And this book is a perfect example of why I disagree with that. She's writing about something very common, a surprise pregnancy. She and her fiance, whoops, accidentally got pregnant before they meant to or before they had even really talked about having kids. And it's all about how she wrapped her mind and her life around the idea of becoming a mother. The subtitle is On Motherhood Before I Was Ready, Mm. which is such a wonderfully universal title because Who's nobody's ready? ever ready. <laughs> if, if you think you're ready, you're not ready. So it's all the way she analyzes the life changes that she goes through struck me as very applicable to any kind of before and after life experience. So it's deep. It's funny. I think it would be a great gift for anybody who is expecting it. And yes. also a great read even if you're not. So that is one of my very, very favorites right now. Love it. Yes. Um, oh, another favorite. We mentioned this briefly last time. Alexander Chi. Yes. Who, who wrote the novel Queen of the Night, has a new memoir in essays coming out in April called How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. Yay. And as I keep telling everyone, it should be called How to Write a Memoir in Essays. Because <laughs> it's a perfect example of this art form. And that's the writer in me speaking because I learned a lot from this book craft wise. But as a reader, I can say so it's just a deeply satisfying reading experience. He really pulls off that magic trick of talking about his life in a way that somehow makes you think about your own life, which that's the mark of a good memoir to me, whether you've, whether you've lived through something extraordinary or you haven't, if you can write about your life in a way that makes other people think about their own life in a different way, you've done it. So he, he looks back on growing up as a young gay man and what it was like to be a young gay man in the middle of the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. He traces his path as a writer going mm. through school and getting his MFA and his early professional work. And my favorite, favorite part, there's an essay about how he and his friends went out in drag one night and what it was like to make up his face as a woman and to walk around as if he were someone else like literally walking in someone else's shoes and trying on someone else's identity. And to me, that was a perfect example of how, how this book is about the trial and error of finding your way to your true self. 
Mm. And everyone has lived that process. Everyone has lived that trial and error, even if you're doing it this exact way. So it's just, it's universal. I love it. I love it. I want everyone. Yeah. I want to read it. It's going to the stack. So that's my two super, super favorite fictions. Um, I will mention two others quickly just because they're good too. Um, (laughs) This one is called Sharp Mm. by Michelle Dean. Have you seen this yet? I'm holding the cover really up close so you can see the caricatures on the front. See Joan Didion? (laughs) Here she is. Um, So Michelle Dean won the National Book Critic Circle Award a couple years ago for excellence in reviewing. Mm. She is a critic. And this book feels a little academic in that it reminds me of something that might be assigned in a college class about nonfiction writing or journalism. Um, But it would be the kind of homework where you would enjoy it so much that you would want to read past your assignment and keep reading. (laughs) It's a history of famous female nonfiction writers in the field of criticism and opinion. So you've got people like Joan Didion, Nora Ephron, Susan Sontag, people whose writing I have always loved. And this book gets into not only what their work said about the times in which they lived, but how their work changed literary history. So a fun read for every former English major. If you miss the kind of stuff that you used to read in college, it's great. You pick it up and put it down. It's fun to have and keep it on your table and a little bit and then come back to it in a week, give you a little bit more. I enjoyed it. And I love the cover. I just think it's really cute. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's hard how much covers influence, but, but they do. When they're good, they're just like candy. I know. And I find myself, when I talk about books that I love, I'm talking about books that I love the insides of, but I always end up mentioning the cover, which is weird. <laughs> I don't think of myself as being superficial, but I guess I am. We can't um, help it, especially when they do such a good job these days. Cover designers are killing it lately. They are killing it. They're doing it. good work. Okay, one more real quick. I know I've talked and talked and talked. <laughs> um, Sloan Crosley. Mm. She's got a new book of humorous essays out. This one's called Look Alive Out There. And basically, if you liked her previous book, you'll like this one. I Was Told There'd Be Cake. And How Did You Get This Number are her prior books of essays. This is right in line with those, but it's just her a little older. So if you like those, get this. Nice. How about that? I love it. Yeah. I love it. Okay, what, what else are you reading? Well, I just picked up this morning because um, this is where the time travel weirdness happens. Because mm-hmm. I think I'm trying to figure out if this episode will have come out before or after this conversation will come out. This morning, at the time of recording this, I am just picking up Tom Rockman's latest because I'm yes. speaking to him next week. Um, that book is coming with me this weekend on my travel. It's in my suitcase right now. And I hate to say it. I, I, I took it because I love him and I love the imperfectionists. And was like, yes. yes. But I love the cover. I can't help it's it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, it's like cover. smeared print everywhere. And it's about a painter. And I I was stuck. I, I've only read like the first paragraph, but I'm already like, yes, I'm, I'm wanting to talk about it because as an art history major in college, I mm-hmm. love books about the art process. Any art restorers, art painters, anybody, biographies about artists, I'm in. So I was very I excited to see him tackle this. I love the imperfectionist. I'm excited about so this much. Yeah, and I'm behind. I meant I meant to have read it already, and I haven't. So I feel that way about we'll like ninety percent of the books out there. I feel like that's my <laughs> motto. Like Caroline, I've meant to have read this already. Don't you? <laughs> like going to a bookstore. Why haven't I read all of these? All of them. <laughs> you can only do what you can do, and there's so much great stuff coming out in early summer. Ooh. Like we we won't talk about it now. We'll do that at our next. This is our teaser podcast date. But oh my goodness, June, so many good books coming June. Explosion. And July. I mean, it's really, it's exciting. It's going to be a great beach reading season. Oh, everybody get ready. Get yeah. ready. So get you have to go read all picked of these. Out. 
go read all of these so that you're ready because you don't want to be behind when all this stuff comes out in June. I know. You got to be ready Just, to hit the ground. Yep. You're going to have to call in sick and read books all day. <laughs> do your, do your like reading it. homework. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you again for firing us up and, and giving us a whole stack of good stuff to dive into. I thank think. You. Thank you. I feel like I might be forgetting something. This is, there's a lot, a lot happening in the book world right now. And probably as soon as we hang up, I'll go, oh, wait, I forgot one more. But this, is a good, <laughs> this is a good start. Start with these and then go into your local bookstore and you find all the ones that maybe I forgot. Yeah. And if you think of anything crazy, we'll just put it in the show notes. So everybody check the show notes. And um, uh, in this episode, actually, you get to check uh, check the brand spanking new website for the show notes. And if there's anything that Mary Laura forgot, we will put it in there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Once again. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.